Pelvic Posse, and welcome to the Empower Your Pelvis podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Empower Your Pelvis podcast. I'm Dr. Amina Fisher. I am your host for the show. This week, I wanted to go over some of the top things I learned from going to the International Society of Studies of Women's Sexual Health Conference. Yes, that's a mouthful. We abbreviate it to ISHWSH, I-S-S-W-S-H. And y'all, it was a phenomenal week. So let me get started. Last week, I went to a conference in St. Louis for just what I said, basically women's health, sexual women's health. And I first got asked about this conference if I was interested in going to be a volunteer, okay? I volunteered my pelvic floor muscles for an exam to teach doctors about the pelvic floor. So first thing that comes to my mind is I don't say yes or no. I'm just like, hey, I'll think about it. Because it takes me back to when I was a student first learning pelvic floor. And if you don't know how you get your pelvic floor certifications, let me fill you in. So we have plinths like the one behind me if you're watching this on YouTube. And you grab a plinth. You have a group of people that gather around the plinth. And you have a lab partner. There are quite a few lab partners without this full room. There might be, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong here, there might be 46 people taking the certification class and then everybody's doubled up as partners. So you have lots of tables where people are just dropping their drawers, climbing on the table and letting you assess your pelvic floor muscles. So that first goes through my mind. And after I was doing those weekend courses with my pelvic floors, man, I was really sore after doing that. I'm not sure if I'm interested. A couple weeks go by, my friend Brooke with Legacy Physical Therapy out in St. Louis messages again. Hey, Amanda, we're still looking for volunteers for Ish Wish. Wondering if you would like to volunteer your pelvic floor to let these healthcare providers learn about the pelvic floor. I talked to my husband. First time I ignored it. Second time I talked to my husband. I'm like, I'll think about it. Didn't really think too far about it. Three weeks goes later. By again, she reaches out. I am all for persistence, y'all. I'm a persistent individual. So when people are persistent, I appreciate that. Because I probably would forget if you're not persistent in my world. There's too much going on. So she reaches out again. Actually, her and um, Stephanie Prendergrass, she's part of Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation out in California, LA area. And I believe even Amy Stein out of the New York East Coast side, they all were looking for volunteers. And I'm like, you know what? This is a sign. I need to go and help educate providers on the public floor. So I go, wake up Wednesday morning. Number one, first, I wake up, I shower, and I shave my legs, and I paint my toes. And these are like three things that our patients come in always wondering, like, oh, I didn't shower, I didn't shave my legs, I'm sorry, my toes aren't painted. And I honestly, I don't care. I don't care because I'm focused on the pelvic floor muscles. But I knew I was going to be on display for multiple people at a conference. There were, I think, 100 docs signed up for this class. So, of course, I shave my legs. I take a shower. I paint my toes. And then I put the heated seats on because it was a cold morning to drive four hours from Kansas City to St. Louis. And I stopped midway in Columbia and realized I had just taken a shower three hours prior to that. And now I'm sweating my ass off, excuse my language, if any kids are around, in my seat. And I'm about to be on display in front of all these doctors. And by golly, I tried. And I just lost it because I was sweating. So I was a little nervous going into the whole thing in that regards. I get to St. Louis. We start the volunt- We start. We had five classes to go through as volunteers. So the as we're waiting around, we're kind of walking in the classrooms to kind of look and see where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing. And myself and Brooke walk in one room and we see a paper plate, scalpels, scissors sitting down. And I look, turn to Brooke and I'm like, what exactly are we examining? Because we didn't have any of this in our public floor courses. And then they come and bring out chicken cutlets. And I was like, oh, thank God. They're working on these chicken cutlets. They're not working on our public floors. So that was a nice thing. Before we moved into that room, we were in a room learning about clitoral pearls, which I was not aware of, but you can have little tiny grains, what feel like a grain of sand in your eyeball. People can have that in their clitoral hood. So it can bug them when they wear underwear or certain garments. I had no no idea about these. So it was very interesting to learn about those. And then we learned like how to, how the procedure worked and how to refer out. 
And then we learned how to do a vestibulectomy. So if people are having vestibule, vestibule pain, so this is all their vulva. The vestibule is more on those inner sides here. The surgery to help decrease their pain. And these are in-office procedures, which is crazy. And then went to that class. And then we moved into where we get to volunteer. So we change from the waist down. We lay on the plinth. The doctors come in with a Q-tip to do a vulvar test. So this is them really touching the tissue to see, is it uncomfortable around the gluteal area where the pudendal nerve is? Is it uncomfortable around the muscles? Pulling back the clitoral hood. Is there mobility? Is it stuck? And they get to do this and decide, is the pelvic pain a hormone issue, nerve issue, or refer to pelvic PT? So that was really cool to coach them through that and to help You know, at first, like some people's hands were a little too strong where I felt like they were ripping my clitoral hood and some were a little light that I'm like, I don't think you're going to elicit a pelvic pain response in these patients. So giving them feedback, true feedback while they're doing it was huge. And we got to educate them on why it was important to do it in a certain touch or a certain brush. And it was amazing. Then you hike up your pants or I didn't have pants on a dress on that day, pull up my underwear, move on to the next room. Then we're on a plinth. Okay. And they're learning how to do a pelvic floor muscle examination. So now they're going in deep, right? So the providers are full into that pelvic floor, some of them up to my cervix. And we're telling them, you know, to back out a little bit. Oh, you're on my tailbone, back it out a little bit more. Great. There are the muscles and giving them feedback in the pressure. So they can quickly do this in their well women exams and where exactly the muscles are. So teaching them levator ani, the deep back portion, out to the hip rotators, up closer, out to the first layer, and how to really, you can hook your fingers and be internal and external at the same time and check if there's any trigger points in tissue. And that was amazing. You could really see the things clicking for these docs of like, oh my gosh, it's an aha moment of there's muscles down here. I'm like, yeah, there is. It was pretty amazing. And then got to look at a nerve test that they can do or a neural test that they can do within a clinic that a clinic out in California is doing. And then we got to watch how Botox is being injected in the pelvic floor muscles. And I was really intrigued by this because they're hitting up. There's a muscle that connects sit bone to sit bone here. It runs across like a straight line and they're doing Botox there. And then also around this figure eight muscle the bulbo muscle here that loops around figure eight around all the openings. And they are doing that for like overactive bladder, anal anal fissures and high tone pelvic floors. So they're doing the Botox, not as a first treatment, but usually our patients have tried vaginal volume suppositories, lidocaine, and then they're ending up with the Botox. So that was really intriguing as well. Um, How they explained it was, you know, PT's dry needle with a solid needle, which we do, and we get an amazing response. And their needles are basically hollow, so they can administer the Botox or the Dysport. So it was interesting because they were seeing a lot of the patients were seeing improvement as well with the dry needling. So we could also try that and loop it in with their pelvic pain, overactive bladder, um, anal fissures, especially around the spinal nerves too. Uh, The spine has a lot to do with what's going on in the pelvic floor and in uh, all the symptoms that relate with bowel and bladder as well. All right. Day two. After that, a little sore. If anybody's wondering, I was a little sore. I had some back pain, back back spasms and some pelvic floor spasms, but day two, they were gone. So we go into day two and it was all about the clitoris. And I loved it because there's not enough in the market on the clitoris, in my opinion. So it just made me giggle because one of the docs talking, I believe it was Dr. Rachel Rubin, first off was like, Who does the clitoris belong to? Like the OB-GYNs don't claim it because their job is the cervix or the uterus. The uro-GYNs aren't claiming it because their job is more of the urethral bladder area. And then um, I forget who the third doc was, but they're like, they're not claiming it either. So people need to start claiming the clitoris and take ownership. As a pelvic floor PT, I was like, well, we can claim it and start, you know, we're already assessing the clitoral hood mobility. We can start looking now for these clinical clitoral pearls that I didn't know existed, but they do. So start really um, adding that into our treatment plan a little bit more would be ideal. And she went in a little bit further how like 2022 was the year of the clitoris or year for the clitoris, because prior to that year, a lot of our netter anatomy books that we had in school didn't show the anatomy of the clitoris. Crazy, right? So they started actually adding the artwork into 
the anatomy books. They started actually researching it. People were getting grants to look at the clitoris to figure out how many nerve endings were in it. Take a guess. It's 10,000 plus nerve endings and the tip of the, or in, the, in the clitoris itself, where we have like 3,000 nerve endings in our finger. So it's pretty crazy how sensitive that organ is. And it's my favorite organ if we had to guess what mine is in the body. So along with that too, we learned how it's affected during menopause. What happens to that tissue? Why is it happening? What happens with cancer treatments? radiation, chemo, how does the clitoris change? Not only the clitoris, but maybe even the vaginal canal, all so important. And it's not just with the gyno cancers. It's not just with ovarian cancer or um, women reporting issues too. like a large percentage of them, oh, cervical cancer, there we go. A lot of them were actually breast cancer survivors. So to even think like breast cancer is further away, right, from the clitoris, but we're seeing a lot of them reporting lack of orgasm, lack of arousal, decreased arousal, decreased orgasm, decreased sensation down there, and us having to pay attention to that. Another thing that struck me were these women were given, especially with the gynecological cancers, are given dilators and just sent home with a dilator told how to do the exercises and no follow-up on that. And they were finding that the women with cancer, only 5% of them were left doing their dilator work after pelvic or after having, after being given their dilator from their doctor. So as a pelvic floor PT, I would hope that would be a direct referral into pelvic floor PT. Or if you know anybody going through cancer treatments, talk to them about pelvic floor physical therapy because we can set them up on a treatment plan and exercise plan, not just for their vagina and the dilator work, but also overall strength and stability, which would be huge for this part of the body. Got to meet some amazing people. We got to see some amazing lubes that had been brought out there. One of my favorite groups is Desert Harvest. They were there with their lidocaine um, lube and some other aloe vera, aloe gel glides as well. Good Clean Love was there and they came out with a new, um, I'm going to butcher it, but I think it's called Refresh Lidocaine one as well. Why would you want lidocaine in a lube? You're using that for patients dealing with pelvic pain. We put the lidocaine on there to relax or decrease the pain before they do their physical therapy, before they do their dilator or wand work at home. We do not, even sometimes just before sleep, you don't want them to use the lidocaine lube with intercourse because it can cause flaccid penis or flaccid issues with your partner. So just be aware of that. But there are great lubes. We also got to meet some amazing people with vibrators. And I thought I chuckled because at one point, one of the doctors was like, question, should we prescribe vibrators to all patients? And the docs are like, yes, we should, because it promotes blood flow and circulation down there. So I thought that was really cool that docs are starting to really recognize that sexual health is like a daily activity or should be considered a daily activity, meaning it's a weekly activity, however often it's happening for you in your home. But it's an activity that's probably happening more often than some people are even getting outside and walking. And we need to recognize that and make sure that people are comforted in their home with what's going on. And they need the resources to really understand what's going on. And if it's things aren't right to go seek help. And um, Another company that came to light off of this vibrator issue was Lioness Health. They created a vibrator. It kind of looks like the rabbit that was out, I don't know, years ago. But the portion that goes internal into the vaginal canal, you can set it up with your phone, sync it with your phone, and it can record how your pelvic floor is moving. So if you needed tactile feedback to know and biofeedback, really, like, Am I squeezing? You can see it on your phone. Am I relaxing the pelvic floor muscles? It shows relaxation. Cool thing is it also teams up with orgasm. So you can see the wave of contraction relaxation, what that looks like on a graph. And the way I understand it, it can show you your how cortisol is linked up with whatever you're seeing on your phone. So it gives you an idea of how stressed you are, which fascinates the heck out of me. Like how cool of a product is that? So of course I bought one for me and I bought one for my mom 
And their marketing employee, which led me into this whole station to begin with, was she had a vibrator dog chew toy. And I just died laughing out loud. And she said, did you know, we received so many messages on people who say that their dog ate their vibrator. And she's like, so we had to make a dog chew toy in that, um, that form just to bring light to the situation. And I just thought, I'm like, you know what? That's excellent marketing. I'll take one. I'll take one for my mom because I'm all about promoting public floor health and blood flow and circulation, especially for my mom who's in menopause or postmenopausal. So that is a little bit of the highlights of my week. I met some amazing people out there. If you have any questions regarding the clitoris or sexual health, I know I'm probably forgetting something because we sat through a lot a lot of um, talks, but they were truly amazing. Who knew there was so much information or so much research being done on these areas or that the government was just now starting to fund some of it too on the clitoris. So truly amazing. Thank you all for listening. And if you made it this far, please like and subscribe to the show. Share this with a friend if you're like, hey, didn't know if you knew about this and see what they think, okay? Have a great day, everybody. Happy wellness in your pelvis and I will see you later. Bye. Hey, Pelvic Posse. I want to thank you so much for joining into this week's episode of the Empower Your Pelvis podcast. Can I ask you a couple of favors, please? Number one, can you like and subscribe to this podcast so that you can continue to empower your pelvis forever so that you will never miss out? Number two, can you leave us a rating and a review telling them how amazing we are and everything that you have learned about your pelvic health? And then number three, if you haven't seen the video version of this podcast, you can go over to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash empower your pelvis for all your visual learners out there. We have all types of great visuals in there for you to not only listen to, but to also watch. Thank you so much again, and make sure to give your pelvis some love. Until next time, peace out, pelvic posse.